Hey, this is David Rovix with a little podcast special for you. What I've got here is a 10-minute sample of my new audio memoir, which I've been working on intermittently for the past three years, called Waiting for Something to Happen. The memoir consists of 16 half-hour episodes. I'll be publishing one episode at a time, every week, until the end of April 2020. It's going out as an exclusive offering for my paid subscribers, such as those who are signed up to send me $2 a month at patreon.com slash davidrovix, or those who joined my community-supported art program on my website at davidrovix.com slash subscribe. A huge project, but one with a limited audience, it seemed like just the thing to make my sort of flagship exclusive offering for patrons in this age where you can stream all my albums for free on Spotify and listen to my two free podcast series there as well. The memoir itself is about eight hours long altogether, but this sample gives you a good idea of both the format and the flavor of it. Whether you sign up to become a patron and listen to the whole thing or not, you can read a bit more about it at davidrovix.com slash audio memoir. Miami 2003 was effectively the end of the global justice movement in the U.S., as it was more or less comprised for at least some years up till that point. The last big grassroots DIY protest of that period, where just the name of the city evokes the memory of the protest you are referring to, was Miami. There was so much about the experience that was so surreal. In retrospect, it reminds me in a smaller way of how Phil Oakes described some of the protests in the early 1970s almost as if aliens from the 60s had invaded the movie set and everybody working on the new movie are looking at them like, who are you and what are you doing here? 9-11 had changed a lot of things. The movement was far shrunken, largely shrunken down to its most militant bits, the rest having moved away for any number of different reasons. Whereas there had previously been a little bit of positive media coverage of the global justice movement, now there was no coverage. We were basically totally off the radar. I believe during the FTAA talks in Miami, something happened with Michael Jackson that was evidently newsworthy enough to kill any possibility of the protests being mentioned. In Miami itself, it was a whole different story. The networks were engaged in 24-7 protest coverage by helicopter, making up ridiculous narratives to go along with what they were filming, always calling obvious cases of unprovoked police brutality clashes with protesters. The local media, along with the police chief, John Timoney, had been busily brainwashing their residents, and especially the local police forces, to fear us, on the basis that we were all anarchists come to destroy the city, along with the rest of society, and civilization more generally. Timoney had shown his cops videos that implied police had been killed by protesters during the WTO meetings in Seattle four years earlier. The Independent Media Center did a wonderful collaborative documentary about all of this called The Miami Model probably one of the last great achievements of indie media as a collective movement force, as far as I know. My friend Juline lived near Miami back then. She was supposedly married, but I never met her husband. She lived in a big house at that time. She and her husband were both involved with commercial radio, and she was also involved with more alternative radio projects, such as her collaboration with Peter Werby, a well-known anarchist and radio personality in Detroit, and editor of Fifth Estate magazine. Peter was someone I had known for years, too, as was Chrissy from St. Louis Catholic Worker, who also came to join us. Julene, Peter, Chrissy, and I explored the police state of South Florida as a foursome. There were many memorable things that stick out to me about that whole visit. First of all, the wild contrast between our lodging situation and everything else we were experiencing. Julene's house included a swimming pool and a hot tub and all the other comforts of a large suburban home. In the world outside, a drive down the highway got you to the closed-off exits of the closed-down center of the city of Miami. Those few who dared enter the boarded-up, abandoned place were generally either riot cops or protesters, tens of thousands of each. I didn't think a city could be more drenched in tear gas than Quebec City had been, but Miami was worse. The riot police rioted again, more extensively than at any other protest in North America I had ever been to. In at least one instance, if a hundred members of the Canadian Labor Congress had not left their safe hotel lobby to defend mostly young people who were being ruthlessly brutalized by heavily armored police, many more people could have been badly injured. As it was, there were many injuries among protesters, including permanent ones. 
this brave action by CLC members was taken without the support of their AFL comrades, according to reports I heard. In fact, the general worshipful attitude towards the cops on the part of so many of the union members who had been bussed in to attend the protests was bizarre and sickening. The mainstream U.S. labor movement had been anemic and poisoned with nationalism before 9-11, but now it seemed to have turned into a twisted caricature. But even these tame union members were too much of a threat for the Miami police state. For some strange and unexplained security reason, almost none of them were allowed into the 10,000-seat amphitheater they were all trying to file into, in which I was scheduled to perform, along with other folks. Having a gig that I wasn't being allowed into was an untenable situation for me, and I argued with the cop in charge of the cops who were preventing us from entering. He gave way and let me in. Once I was in this big empty space, I realized how pointless that argument had been. What happened next was a labor rally took place in this almost completely empty fenced-in amphitheater. A vast space with around 200 people scattered around on our side of the fence, and beyond the fence tens of thousands. Then, as this surreal union rally for nobody was taking place, the rioting kicked off outside the fence. I believe what happened was the police declared a riot zone and then clear started clearing the streets with maximum violent but non-lethal force using all the fancy new non-lethal weaponry they had recently spent millions to buy. I don't know how long I played for as the rioting intensified beyond the fence. I could smell the tear gas, but it wasn't debilitating where I was. I felt helpless, but I didn't see the point in gathering on our side of the fence and yelling at the police like a group of the people inside the amphitheater were doing. I kept singing, trying to think of songs that could possibly be good songs for people to hear while they were inhaling tear gas and being tasered and clubbed by riot police. I think the program of speakers was basically suspended when the rioting kicked off, and they just let me keep singing. It wasn't like I was trying to hog the stage to play for nobody. After a while, I was pleasantly surprised to see Tom Morello, Steve Earle, and Billy Bragg there on the stage with me. Together, they asked if they could borrow my guitar, and each of them did a couple of songs with it. Their instruments and gear were already on a bus, headed to the next destination on their tour. I met many people afterwards, who heard me singing through The Clashes. I had a tour set up up the East Coast after Miami. It was November, so that tour included the SOA protests in Georgia, such a peaceful scene in comparison. Everywhere, everywhere I went up the coast, I met people at my gigs who had just been in Miami. Most of them had terrible welts from being hit multiple times with rubber-coated steel bullets and other weaponry. My friend Felony had been tasered on her breast. She was a bit of an exhibitionist in the first place, so she was happy to have an excuse to take her shirt off every few minutes and show people her wounds. The wounds people had often resembled baseballs, and were about as hard as them, too. Leaders of the world had gathered to make the planet freer for free trade, to create a better business climate for all the profits they had made, surrounded by an army. There for their defense, armed with APCs and copters, and lots of common sense behind a fence, behind a wall that shouts, You shall not pass. Broken skulls, plastic bullets, and a thousand gallons of tear gas. And the world leaders kept on talking behind the moat upon the hill. And they boasted of prosperity in their latest free trade bill. They thank God, they thank Boeing, they thank the World Bank, they thank the firepower of the M1 tank. They defended their positions and the glory of their class. With broken skulls, plastic bullets, and a thousand gallons of tear gas. On the streets we chanted, we have no clubs or guns. We've just come to tell the people the evil ways this system runs. But the truth can set us free, the rulers all knew well. So they drowned the truth with copters and the ringing of the bell. With their teasers on our bodies and our faces in the grass. 
broken skulls, plastic bullets, and a thousand gallons of tear gas. Cameras hid behind the lines A half a million men in blue When the rich men moved their lips They recorded them on cue The occupation of a city By an army of police Wasn't worthy of a mention From the reporters of the peace Neither were the wounded children Or the boarded glass Or the broken skulls Plastic bullets And a thousand gallons of tear gas This has been a segment from my audio memoir, Waiting for Something to Happen. Some anecdotes and ruminations from my first 50 years with songs. Find out more at davidrovics.com slash audio memoir.